441 together, 441 in your hymnal. Let's all stand together as we sing Sunlight in My Soul, 441. On that first together, I wandered in the shades of night till Jesus came to me, and with the sunlight of communion find I press with holy vigor on and leave this world behind sunlight sunlight in my soul today I shall see him as he is, the light that came to me. Behold the brightness of his face throughout eternity. Sunlight, sunlight, in my soul today. Sunlight, sunlight, all along the way. Since the Savior found me, took away my sin, I have had the sunlight of his love. Good singing tonight. Good to see you in church on a Labor Day weekend Sunday night. And uh, appreciate you being back. I hope all the saints are doing well. <laughs> good, good. All right. Hope you caught that. And uh, good to have you back this evening. Looking forward to what God has for us tonight. Let's start with a word of prayer, shall we? Father, we thank you for this evening. Thank you, Lord, for another opportunity to gather together with the people of God here in this place. And Lord, we love you this evening. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your grace to us. And Father, we pray that you will meet with us tonight. Uh, honor the faithfulness of your people that are here in their place on a Sunday evening. And I pray, God, that you'd be pleased with the service tonight. Would you control it? And Lord, the best we know how, we yield ourselves to you that you could minister to our hearts tonight. Make this exactly what you would like it to be. And use it in our hearts and lives so we might be better servants for thee. And I pray and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, you may be seated. Well, this next song is turned into one of my favorites. I get to sing it about three times a week anyway. We're going to sing Victory in Jesus. 341, I heard an old, old story how a Savior came from glory. Let's sing it. Are you style, all right? On that first together. I heard an old, old story How a Savior came Plunge me. 
singing man that's great love that song all right 22 at the nursing home this afternoon and uh down at columbus health care and um but danny was telling me paul lamprecht come down and sang for him is that right wasn't that great i said we need a video of that and uh i'd love to love to have that that'd be great and uh thankful for those workers who were there and good service at the nursing home um regular schedule now uh, this week and uh, Wednesday night for the midweek service at 7 o'clock right here. The Bible clubs for the kids will be meeting, the children's club on Wednesday night, so uh, make sure you're present for that. Uh, then, of course, Thursday night we'll be down at CRC and Friday night for Reformers Unanimous right here. Uh, Saturday morning, uh, the guys will be at London. We'll have our normal soul winning bus visitation at 10 a.m. and uh, right back on schedule. Uh, for this coming week, okay? And uh, remember to get your uh, gifts and everything. If you haven't got those in yet for the missionaries, the cards and such, bring those in if you would. Make sure those get turned in. We appreciate your help with that. Uh, the sign-up sheet for both the parade and uh, international dinner is down on the table in the foyer. And uh, appreciate you signing up and being a part of those activities during the missions conference. Please note that the conference will begin at 6.30 on Thursday and Friday. Um, 7 o'clock Wednesday night, we do have um, the Kiefers who are missionaries to Brazil, and uh, they'll be with us, and the church has supported them before I came uh, many, many years, and um, they've been on the field, I believe, over 30 years, and so they'll be checking in with us, uh, to my knowledge, the first time since I've been here. Uh, that they've been back to, to see us and meet with us. So they'll be checking in on Wednesday night. So uh, they'll they'll be on Wednesday night right before the conference on the 16th. Then we'll start the conference on the 17th. Uh, the, remember, Thursday night and Friday night will be 6.30. Okay, so make a note of that and remember that. Uh, and you'll be out by 8.30 each night. Okay, we'll move that up, get you out. Uh, don't worry. It's, you know, if you keep your kids up an extra half hour or 45 minutes, it's well worth it for God to speak to their heart and uh, they can they can handle that for being a, a little bit later going to bed on a, on a Thursday night so they can be part of the missions conference okay all right I think that's all I've got and uh, looking to see if anybody's here tonight good to see Chris and Sandy I believe back tonight for the evening service and I'm glad you ladies are here thank you for coming and I uh, think rest of us home folk are here all right let's hear from the choir all right
246, 246, I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day, still praying as I'm onward bound, Lord plant my feet on higher ground, 246, let's sing that, uh, sing that first together, I'm pressing on the upward way. Some make well where these are bound. My prayer, my aim is higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me send my faith on heaven, stable land, a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. I want to scale the utmost height. singing. Let's turn over to 191, if you would. 191. Count your many blessings. Name them one by one. 191. Let's all stand together one more time. Did you find that? On that first together. When upon life's billows you are tempest-tossed. And greet one another. Make somebody feel welcome, especially our guests. We'll come back and sing that last stanza together.
your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. So amid the conflict, whether great or small, do not be discouraged. Because God is over all. Count your blessings even in those conflicts. Let's sing that last together. So amid the conflict, whether great or small, do not be discouraged. God is Be seated, if you will. The ushers will come, and we'll get our offering tonight. And Brother Wallace, lead us in our prayer this evening. Father, as we come to your house and Lord, want to desire to learn of your word. Lord, we would ask that you would help us to be respectful that we are in God's house. To, Lord, uh, yield to the Spirit and allow our ears to hear the precious words from your book. And then, Lord, would you please help us to let it shine through us when we walk out these doors. Lord, it's no good for us just to sit here and to listen and to go and be the same as we were yesterday. And Father, we need your help. In and of ourselves, we are nothing. And Father, as we yield to you tonight, we would just ask that the Holy Spirit would do a work in each of our hearts that, Lord, would make us a better soldier for you tomorrow than what we are today. Bless the offering. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Take your Bible this evening, and I want you to open to 2 Timothy chapter 4, if you would please, and then put a finger in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 1 Thessalonians 5, and we'll look at a verse there, and then we'll read together in 2 Timothy 
chapter 4, 2 Timothy chapter 4 first, if you would please. We're going to read the first five verses of 2 Timothy chapter 4, and we'll read that responsibly as we normally do, beginning together on verse 1, then we'll turn over to 1 Thessalonians 5 and read there, all right? As our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture. All of us standing, please, to read God's word, and let's begin together on verse 1 of 2 Timothy chapter 4. Ready? I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. And then over to First Thessalonians in chapter 5. Notice with me that verse number 20, just three words, verse number 20, let's read it together, ready? Despise not prophesyings, let's pray, shall we? Father, add your blessing to the reading of these scriptures here tonight, and I pray God that you would prepare our heart, and that we'd be ready to receive the truth of the word of God this evening. Lord, there's many, many things that could capture our attention and uh, divert our attention away from focusing on what you have for us tonight and I pray you would help us and uh, Lord enable us to focus and to concentrate so that the Spirit of God might minister his word to each of us this evening Lord use the special to that end please in Jesus name we ask it amen Though your friends may forsake you 
forsake you. Jesus has promised to walk right by your side. God's word does not change and the truth still remains. That people are dying each day without Jesus. Oh, Christian, be bold and stand up. Stand up, though you may be the only one to take a stand. God sees and cares about the stand you take. Stand up for the truth, though the world rise against you. A lost soul is counting on you to be bold. Truth, though your friends may forsake you, Jesus has promised to walk right by your side. God's word does not change, and the truth still remains. That people are dying each day without Jesus. Oh, Christian, be bold and stand up. Thank you, Sarah. Good to have Sarah Cato here. Uh, got to come into town for a few days and see your mom. Did you write that song? Yeah. Uh, good, good message in that song, Sarah. And um, are you, when are you heading out to go to Brazil? When is it? The 23rd. All right. She's uh, done it. How much support do you have? 100%. Wow. And how, how long were you on deputation, sir? Two years. Wow. That's hard to believe. That went by, went by fast to us. I don't know how fast it went by to you, but uh, that's exciting. That's great. I'm sure mom and dad are looking forward to having you down to be a help to them uh, in the ministry. That's, uh, that's exciting. That's great. Thank you for singing for us tonight. Appreciate that. Father, we bow before you now as we come to the preaching of your word. Thank you, Lord, again for the Wonderful privilege it's ours to gather together and to open up the Bible. Lord, we realize that there are places in this world where we could not do that. And Lord, we're thankful that so far in America we're able to do this. We pray, Lord, that you'll help us and, and speak to us tonight. And Lord, help us uh, to do our best to give our attention to the only book you've ever written. May your will be accomplished in each of our hearts tonight. Help me as I bring the message and help the people as they listen. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. The command of Timothy, I'm going to start in Timothy first, if your Bible's still there, it's 2 Timothy chapter 4. The command of Timothy from Paul was to preach the word. Verse number 2, preach the word, Timothy. Uh, Timothy exhorted to be instant in season and out of season. Notice, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Why would you do that, Timothy? Verse 3. Because the time's going to come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but will after their own lust, that's their own desires, heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. In other words, there's going to come a time when they're not going to hear the, the truth of the Bible. They want you to tell them what they like to hear, what's, what's easy on the ears. You ever, you ever, it's, it's, you ever have an itch? And, and, and when you get an itch and you scratch it, what's that feel like? Thank you. Ah, yeah, that's good. That's how people want their preaching. They want, they want to be able to ha come to church and just have the preacher preach where they can say, ah, that's nice. Uh, I enjoyed that. Or that was, that, that was soothing. Or that, that was good. Uh, and and, and that's, that's what he said. Timothy going to come to that. They're not going to hear, thus saith the Lord. They're not going to want to come to church and say, woe is me, for I am undone. Okay? And he's saying, Timothy, be prepared for that. In fact, that day is come. I think we're living in that day right now, at least, at least in the United States of America. Um, the center of the platform in fact, uh, the, I, I read recently where they, the, the statement was made, you cannot preach to the 21st century church. That was a statement, the conclusion that they've come to. 
And when you look at the modern church and you see the center of the platform in the modern church is not the pulpit, it's a drum set that we, we, we have turned into magicians, drama uh, people, videos, musicals, seminars, and comedians. Every, anything at all except preaching. Preaching of the Word of God and preaching the Word. But the, God, the command of God is clear to Timothy, and I think it's clear to us, preach the Word. Preach the Word. Much of what we, I think much of what we're dealing with in our society today where we have a, even have a Christian in jail for, for, not, uh, for, for standing for a religious conviction. And, and, and let me make sure we understand, the, Supreme, the courts cannot make laws. When the Supreme Court passed the, by five to four, saying that they think that, uh, sec, that marriage between a man and a man or a woman and a woman is okay, that's fine. Congress has never made a law saying same-sex marriage is a law in America. Congress makes the laws, not the courts. And you have to understand that. And they don't have the power to make that law. By the way, Kentucky has no law regarding same-sex marriage, nor is it in the Kentucky Constitution. This woman is in Kentucky. She is upholding the Constitution of the state of Kentucky, and she is upholding the laws of the state of Kentucky, where she was elected to be a clerk. And so uh, it, is, it is religious conviction. I read today... There's a judge in Texas. Texas does not have any kind of same-sex marriage. She is a lesbian judge. She has refused for nearly three years now to issue any marriage licenses to anybody. She's still practicing on the bench. Nothing happens to her at all for not issuing. She won't issue any license to anybody. But neither was Kim Davis. She was not giving out licenses to heterosexual couples. She was just not giving out licenses, period. She just shut it down. So not to be discriminatory. Because they would, they would have got her for discrimination had she not done that. And so just, uh, but listen, hey, the reason that someone like that's in prison and Hillary Clinton isn't shows the, 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 the type of society that we're in. It shows the, the mess we're in in America. Uh, it's, a, it's a sad state we're in. We'll say what, I, I'm not saying that I'm not going to be simplistic and say this is the only reason, but I say a large part of that is due to the lack of preaching in our churches. The lack of preaching. We've steered away from preaching of the Word of God. Preachers have stopped preaching the Word. Let me give you several things about preaching the Word. Number one, God commands it. God commands that we have the preaching of the Word of God. And number two, God has promised to bless it. Isaiah chapter 55, verses 10 and 11. Uh, let, look there, will you please? Let's go ahead and use your Bible tonight. Look at Isaiah 55. Go to the Old Testament. Isaiah chapter 55. This will be familiar to some, but maybe brand new to others. Isaiah 55, and we're going to look at verses 10 and 11. Notice the Bible says, For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth in bud, that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please. And it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. God says, when my word goes forth, uh, it will prosper what I send it out to do. That His word never returns void. Don't ever think when there's preaching, the preaching of the word of God, by the way, from the pulpit or from you individually as you preach the gospel to someone, don't ever think that's in vain. It's never in vain. It will never return void. Void is empty, worthless, nothing to it. God says it will always prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. Uh, God commands it. God has promised to bless it. Number three, that it's the preaching of the Word of God, by the preaching of the Word of God, that souls are saved. Notice 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Paul writing to the church there. By the way, let's start, I was going to start in verse 18. Let's start in verse 17 because there's an important truth there I want you to see. Where Paul says, verse 17 of 1 Corinthians 1, Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. There are some who would add baptism to the gospel, but that wasn't the gospel Paul preached. Uh, he said, God didn't send me to baptize, He sent me to preach the gospel. 
The gospel is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. No baptism in there. Not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Now here we go. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Preaching. God says, that's my tool that I'll use to save folks that believe. The preaching of the Word of God. But it's not only the way people get saved, it's by the Word of God that believers are built up in the faith and built up and nurtured in the ways of God. Look at Acts chapter 20. Would you go there, please? Acts chapter 20. Paul is leaving the folks at Ephesus here. <clears throat> and Acts chapter 20. Notice what he said in verse number 32. Acts 20, verse 32. Paul says, And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the what? Word of His grace which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them that are sanctified. He says, I'm committing you to God and to the word of His grace. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, which uh, you're, you're in chapter 4 of 2 Timothy. If you get back there, look right up to chapter 3. You know this verse, verse 16. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. It's by the Word of God that every Christian is truly or completely furnished uh, unto all good works. It's only by the Word of God. Preach the Word. Preach the Word. You'll start the New Testament. You'll find John the Baptist came on the scene preaching the Word. You'll find Jesus Christ be in His ministry preaching the Word of God. You'll find out that when Pentecost came, that Peter stood up preaching. And we're going to look at his sermon in just a few minutes. And, and he was preaching the Word of God. The early believers, when they were scattered abroad about the persecution, they went everywhere preaching the Word of God. Philip went down to Samaria preaching the Word of God. When he got the eunuch in the desert, he preached Christ to him from the book of Isaiah. Titus 1 and verse 3 says, God hath in due times manifested His Word through preaching. Preach the Word. Preach the Word. It's interesting that Paul would tell Timothy there'll come a time when they'd rather heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. There's very few, you know, I've noticed, and, and we're on the radio, and, uh, but there's very few preachers on the radio. There's a lot of teachers on the radio. Uh, very few preachers on the radio anymore. People who are uh, preaching the Word of God. Uh, I, I had this years ago, teaching, the difference between teaching and preaching. Teaching will burden you, but preaching will bother you. Uh, teaching will capture your mind, but preaching will correct your heart. Teaching will dazzle your mind, but preaching will deliver your soul. Teaching will make you concerned, but preaching will make you convicted. Teaching may flatter you, but preaching will forbid you. Teaching may furnish you facts, but preaching will force you to a decision. Teaching will help you, preaching will humble you. Uh, teaching is loved while preaching is laughed at. Teaching is popular, but preaching is profitable. Teaching is promoted while preaching is protested. Teaching satisfies a need, but preaching will strike a nerve. Teaching will tickle the ear, but preaching will trouble the soul. You'll never outgrow your need for preaching. Now I want you to turn to the book of Acts chapter 2, would you please? Acts chapter 2. This is Peter's sermon on Pentecost. Acts chapter 2. It begins in verse number 14 and it goes all the way to verse number 40. We'll not read it all at once, but we'll read a little bit of this, because I want you to look at this sermon that Peter preached, and I want to point out to you the qualities of good preaching. The qualities of good preaching. How many of you think you've heard good preaching in your life? See your hand. Good. Appreciate you putting your hand up. How many, how, how many have heard bad preaching in your life? Be honest. 
Okay? All right, good. And uh, so, we, so we, we've heard them both. What makes good and what makes bad? Well, let's see what, what, what is involved here with the preaching. Verse number 14, Peter standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing it's but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it, came, and it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my Spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Don't you notice the first quality of good preaching is number one, it's simple. It's simple. Easy to understand. All right? You didn't need a dictionary to look up the words Peter's using. Okay? Uh, he's making it very plain. And Paul, you remember we read in 1 Corinthians, he said, I didn't come to you with the words uh, uh, that, that man's wisdom teaches. Uh, Paul could have spoke in such a way that probably he could have talked over the heads of anybody listening to him. Paul's a very educated man and uh, brought up at the feet of Gamaliel, a very learned teacher there in, in Jerusalem and very well respected. And in fact, we know that Paul spoke at least five languages and possibly more. And certainly he could have lost them all if he wanted to. And, uh, but he says, I'm not going to speak in the words that man's wisdom teaches. There was nothing uttered here that a child would not be able to understand. In fact, if you, if you look ahead a little bit to Acts 14, uh, we'll come back to Acts chapter 2 in just a minute. Look at Acts chapter 14, and this is Paul and Barnabas on their missionary journey, and we talked about them this morning in, ver in chapter 13. Notice chapter 14 of Acts. It says, it came to pass in Iconium, that they went both together, that's Paul and Barnabas, into the synagogue of the Jews, notice, and so spake that a great multitude, both of the Jews and also of the Greeks, believed. They so spake so that a great multitude could believe. Uh, now listen, you can have preaching that can so speak that nobody could believe. I, I have sat and I've listened to sermons and I've heard preachers, and, and, and sometimes the way they talk about salvation... I wasn't even sure how to be saved, and I know how to get saved. And, and I wasn't sure what they were trying to get across. Uh, God says that ought to, we ought to be able to so speak that it's easy, that it's simple for a multitude to believe. And, and it is. Jesus said, except you become as a little child, you'll in no wise enter into the kingdom of God. And, and, and it ought to be as simple that a child should be able to understand it. Spurgeon, uh, back in Spurgeon's day at the Metropolitan Tabernacle in London, <clears throat> he would fill the, the, the building, uh, I think, about three or four times on a Sunday. And, and oftentimes you would have to have a ticket to go to the service. It wasn't it, no charge, but they could only fit so many in the building. And so if you had a ticket for the, this particular service, that's when you'd go. And one time a, a lady was concerned about her 12-year-old son, and she said, I want you to go. And you go here, Mr. Spurgeon. And tell me what you think. And so she gave her ticket to him, and he went to the service. And he came back later that afternoon, and she goes, well, what'd you think? And he said, well, I don't think he was so hot. I understood everything he said. And uh, when Spurgeon was told of that story, he said, would to God that every time I preach, every 12-year-old would understand exactly what I'm saying. And it's simple. It ought to be simple. It ought to be easy to be understood. You see, preaching is not a display of knowledge. It's a transfer of knowledge. Preaching, preaching doesn't take place if you don't leave this auditorium with what, knowing what I came in knowing. Make sense? I, I want to impart what, what, what uh, God has given to me, to you, so you leave with what I came in with. Does that make sense? That's preaching. And that has to be simple. So I see that it was simple. And you know, when Jesus preached, He used simple things, didn't He? Didn't He talk about a lost sheep? And a lost coin? And two sons? And a fig tree? And, and a fish? And, and He spoke of wheat and weather? He always used simple things that everyone could relate to. 
Okay? So it was simple. Now, I want you to notice, secondly, back to Acts chapter 2, all right? Acts chapter 2, notice starting in verse number 22, the second thing about good preaching is it's Christ-centered. It's Christ-centered. Verse 22, Him, who's Him? That's Jesus. Being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken, and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible he should be holden of it. We go on down to verse number 32. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this which ye now see and hear. David, for David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou here in my right hand, till I make thy foes thy foot still. Let, therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Christ crucified, risen, and coming again. He centered his focus on Jesus Christ. Preaching has to center on Christ and what He has done, what He is doing, what He has done in us, what He is doing in us, what He wants to do through us, but it's always centered on Jesus Christ. Colossians says that in all things, He is to have the preeminence. He's to have the preeminence in the church. And how can we come to church then and not talk about Jesus? If He's to be the focus, if He's to be the, 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 the center point, we have to always lift Him up. What did Jesus say? And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. So how do we get drawn to Jesus? Somebody's got to lift Him up. Somebody's got to hold Him up. And we hold up Jesus when we come. It's always centered on Christ. Therefore, listen, hey, we say He is all we need. And He can meet all of our needs. I cannot meet everybody's need. So I can't lift me up to you. Because I will fail you. I will not meet your needs. But Christ can. Christ can. And so I have to lift Him up. I have to make sure that He is the one that we're drawn to. And all men will be drawn unto Him if we lift up Christ. So we find that good preaching is simple. Good preaching is Christ-centered. Good preaching, number three, is pointed it's pointed. Did you notice verse 23? When he talked about Jesus, he said, Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken, and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Verse number 36. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Boy, the rubber was meeting the road, wasn't it? You're... And in other words, you're, you've done this and you've done... He didn't have any problem telling them, you crucified Jesus. It was because of you <clears throat> that He died on the cross. It's, it's because of you that He was crucified. And he, he, he let it be known pretty pointedly. Nobody had to sit there and think, who's He talking about? Is He referring to us? Is it, could that be us? They knew exactly what He was saying. It was very pointed. <clears throat> you know, we read 2 Timothy 3 and verse 16 earlier, and that's a verse that's used often in Reformers Unanimous, and Brother Currington explains that verse, that, that God says that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. He says it tells us what is right, that's doctrine, it tells us what is not right, that is reproof, it tells us how to get it right, that's correction, and it tells us how to keep it right, that's instruction in righteousness. And that's what preaching does. Preaching what? Tells you what, 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 is, what, what you're doing that's not right. It tells, you, it tells you what is right. It tells you how to get right. And it tells you how to stay right. Okay? And by the way, when you do that, it gets kind of down home. Uh, I can't tell you the times that, that people walk out the door and say, did, did you have a tape recorder in our house this week? Or, or, or a wife comes by, and, or a husband, usually it's the husband, says, my wife's been talking to you. You know, uh, there's there there's one fellow who who won't come because he thinks when he when he came to church a few times that I was preaching to him. Now now I was, but not me. The Holy Spirit was, and and you know you have been in the service and you felt like the preacher was preaching at you. Yeah, that's the Holy Spirit speaking to you, 
And, and you ought to feel that way. And, and it ought to be that way. It ought to be a pointed, uh, a pointed sermon. Someone walked out the door one day and said to the preacher, boy, you really stepped on my toes. And the preacher said, I'm sorry. I was aiming for something higher. He said, I was aiming for your heart. So don't, don't, don't just say, except on my toes, say, God touched my heart. Because that's what preaching ought to do in the pointed preaching. Sometimes you'll feel like you're the only one in the room, but that's good preaching. That's good preaching. And that's when God zeroes in on your heart. Preaching is not just to inform. Preaching is to transform. It's to change your life, and God uses it. It's pointed. Number four, the fourth thing about preaching is it demands a response. It demands a response. Verses 37 and 38. Notice what the Bible says. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. He's saying, here's what you do is you repent. And by the way, 3,000 of them did. And they got baptized. And they obeyed the Lord. Good preaching always brings you to a decision. Good preaching will always bring you to a decision. <clears throat> the response to a good preaching should not be, well, that was interesting. Or, that was informative. Or, that was good. Huh? It should be what they said. What am I going to do with the truth I just heard? What am I going to do? You have a decision to make. Good preaching brings you to a decision. And, and, and by the way, that's why there's altar calls. Why? Because you have a decision to make. And you make that decision. God speaks to your heart. You respond to what God's told you to do. And that's why there's an altar call. Because you want to respond to what God tells you to do. You you, when, when, that, when God causes that triangle to go around in your heart and that, those, those sharp edges start cutting you, you better respond to that. If you ignore it, you know what you find out? Those sharp edges start wearing off. And pretty soon it goes around. It doesn't hurt quite so bad the next time. And it doesn't hurt hardly at all the next time. And pretty soon, by you ignoring it, those sharp edges, that conviction of the Spirit of God wears off. And pretty soon it just spins around and you don't ever feel anything anymore. You hear sermon after sermon after sermon and preaching after preaching after preaching and nothing ever speaks to your heart. Boy, that's a bad place to get. Don't get there. All right? Ask God what He wants you to do. What response should I give uh, to the preaching of the Word of God? All right? Well, that's the introduction. Now we get to the sermon. The, the good news is the introduction was long. The sermon is short. Okay? All right? I told you I was going to talk about despise not prophesying. You say, what has all that got to do with this? Now, 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse number 20. Paul is giving practical instructions to the Thess Thessalonians here. And a lot of simple principles that he gives. He starts by saying, you, you, you warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak. Be patient toward all men. Not see that none render evil for evil on any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and all men. Then he has the short ones. Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the spirit. And then ours for tonight. Despise not prophesying. Despise not prophesying. Now, prophesying in the Bible is twofold. You had those who would prophesy, which is a, or a foretelling of the truth. Uh, in other words, they're prophesying, meaning they're, they're, they're talking about something in the future that's going to happen. All right? Uh, that prophet, some of the prophets in the Old Testament, in fact, God said the way you know it's a lying prophet is what he says is going to happen doesn't happen. And if that didn't happen, you had a right to put that guy to death. And so it was important that, that if you don't lie about your prophecy. And so that's one prophecy. But here, here in this context, it also was a forth telling, F-O-R-T-H, a forth telling of the truth, or what we would call preaching. All right? 
preaching the word of God. Um, in fact, Webster defines prophesying as preaching, the public interpretation of Scripture, the exhortation of instruction. Okay? So he's really saying, despise not preaching. You just heard about preaching and how God commanded it and how God uses it and, and what makes good preaching. And now God says, don't you despise that. Now, what's despise mean? Despise means to contemn. It means to have a low opinion of. It means to scorn or to disdain. <clears throat> so the command is, don't scorn, don't disdain, don't have a low opinion of preaching. Don't do that. And so, and, and, and by the way, that's where we've come to often in many churches in America. When, when you replace preaching with a drama, what are you saying? When you replace preaching with a singspiration, what are you saying? When you replace preaching with family night or family time, what are you saying? When you replace preaching with a comedian, what are you saying? When you replace preaching with, with canceling church on holiday weekends on Sunday night, what are we saying? Boy, it's quiet. Hmm? Mark my word. Mark it down. I'll, I'll, I'll prophesy. All right? Listen, the, the churches that, that, are, that are cutting out their Sunday night service when it's Labor Day, when it's Father's Day, when it's Mother's Day, when it's, when it's Easter Sunday, when in any July 4th weekend, it's not going to be, it won't be long till they'll lose their Sunday night service altogether. Because the message you're saying is, it's not that big of a deal. We can do without it. Hey, if I can do without it six, seven times a year, why can't I do without it all the time? Hello? Are you out there? We replace preaching with staying at home. What are we saying? When we replace preaching with staying in the hallway instead of being in the church service, what are we saying? Am I saying that what I'm doing is more important than listening to preaching? There is a difference. I sent that to somebody today. I said there is a difference between being at church and being in church. A lot of people are at every, they're at every church service, but they're not in every church service. You ought to be, if you're at church, let's be in church. Amen. That's good preaching right there. I usually will listen to about four sermons a week. I try to read four sermons a week. I preach five sermons a week. So... I get 13 sermons a week. And by the way, if you don't think that the one preaching the sermon doesn't get something out of it, you're, you're mistaken. Brother, Brother Yoder, ever preach yourself under conviction? Yeah. It happens, you know. Bob, amen. Guys who, who teach and preach, you know that's true. So why do, you, why do you read four sermons and listen to four sermons? You know why? Because I need preaching too. Nobody outgrows their need for preaching. Let's exalt preaching. Let's, let's keep preaching preeminent. It's been that way at Bible Baptist Church. We're going to keep it that way at Bible Baptist Church. Now, let me close you by giving you four practical things, all right? Four practical ways. How, how should I listen to preaching? All right? How should I listen to preaching? I'm glad you asked me. I'm going to tell you. Number one, you listen carefully. Listen carefully. What's that mean? Have your Bible in hand. Have a pen in hand. Have something ready to write down what God speaks to you about or something that you want to remember. Give your attention fully to the preaching. Now, you're not here to see who else is here. You're not here to look at, oh, look at her outfit. Oh, look what she's wearing. Oh, did you see what so-and-so had on today? Oh, did you see? Huh? Lady come home from church and she told her husband, Oh, did you see so-and-so's hat today? No. Well, didn't you notice, notice so-and-so's dress that she had on? No. Well, did you see Mr. So-and-so's new suit? Uh, no. 
She goes, well, what good did it do you to go to church today? Huh? That's how some people are. It's not, not to look at everybody. Listen, we're, we're here. That's why when it comes to preaching, that's why we don't like coming in and out. That's why we don't want you just up and walk around. You know what happens when that happens? Everybody looks at you. That's why, that's why we, we encourage the little babies to go to the nursery. Because you can't compete with that. If there's, a, if there's a baby up here on the second or third row, you know what? Everybody for about three, four rows back there, they're all looking at that little baby. Even if they're good. They're all looking and say, oh, look how cute she is. They don't want to look at me. They want to listen to what I'm saying. And you know what happens? They miss what's, what God has for them. Miss what happens when you, when you decide to chat or talk or you have your phone out and it, that little ding comes up and you know you got a message from somebody on Facebook or you got some and you look at that and you, and you know what? You just lost your attention on what God wanted to say to you. If I was the devil and I didn't want you to hear something, I'd have a message come through right then that will distract you so you don't get what that was. Carefully. Number two, you listen prayerfully. You listen prayerfully. You pray for your pastor. I hope you do. I hope you pray. When you come into service, say, Lord, I'm praying. Help, help them to make sense. Help them to, to, to get it across in a way we can understand. Pray for yourself. God, speak to my heart. God, give me understanding. Show me what you want to teach me today. Pray for yourself. Then pray for others. God, speak to others' hearts today. Lord, if there's any in the room that aren't saved or they're lost, Lord, save them today. All right, pray for others. Number three, <clears throat> you listen powerfully. Powerfully. What's that mean? You ought to be a spirit-filled listener. Hey, pray for the pastor to be filled with the Spirit and that he'll be led by the Spirit and that he'll be guided by the Spirit. But listen, you ought to be filled with the Spirit to listen to the Word of God. The Spirit of God wrote the book. And you want Him to be able to teach you. And so He will teach you to be a Spirit-filled listener that you'll have ears to hear what the Spirit would say to the church. And number four, listen responsefully. I'm not sure that's a word, but it, it's a fully, and I needed one. Responsefully. And all that means is, all it means is this, what will I do with the truth that I heard today? What will I do with this truth? What am I going to do with what I've heard? What shall we then do? Preaching. Preaching. Let's despise, not prophesying. Let's pray, shall we? Father, take the truth now this evening. Lord, thank you that this church for 60 years has stood on preaching. And Lord, by your grace, we'll continue to stand upon the preaching of the Word of God. Thank you for people who come to church faithfully, not to be entertained, not to watch a show, but they come faithfully to hear the Word of God. Lord, thank you for people who, through my years here, have always faithfully responded to the preaching of the Word of God. Lord, I thank you for what you've done here in our midst. And Lord, I realize that on a holiday weekend on a Sunday night this is the crowd that doesn't despise prophesying this is the crowd that thinks much of preaching or they wouldn't be here tonight and I pray that you would encourage them and bless them and Lord may they use some of these truths tonight to be an encouragement to others who maybe think it's no big deal to miss church May you use them and allow them to be an encouragement to others through this message. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. and <clears throat> I'll finish the prayer here in just a minute and we'll have your invitation. I just wonder tonight if how many here this evening would just say, Preacher, the Spirit of God stopped at my seat tonight. He did speak to my heart this evening. Maybe, probably nothing new. Maybe something new to you but maybe just something you need to be reminded of. And again, the importance of preaching and how God will use it in each of our lives. But I wonder if, if the Spirit of God stopped at you and you say, Preacher, God dealt with my heart tonight and I've got to respond to what God's told me to do. Pastor, pray for me this evening. 
would just lift your hand up and say, Pastor, pray for me tonight. Oh, that's good. Amen. Amen. All right, you may put them down. In a moment, we'll pray, and I'll have the invitation. God has spoken to your heart. I want you to respond to him tonight and do what he's put on your heart to do. Heavenly Father, thank you for speaking to our hearts this evening. Lord, thank you for these who have lifted their hands up and maybe even some who didn't, but you did speak to them. And Lord, we're so thankful that you still use the preaching of your word to speak to our hearts. And I pray that each of us would value the preaching of the word of God and hold it in high regard for how you've used it in our lives, Lord, and how you can still use it in the lives of others and in our life. Now, Father, have your way in this invitation. May your will be done in every heart and life. And I'll thank you for it. With your heads bowed, your eyes closed, stand to your feet if you would, please. As you stand, Pianist is going to play. As she plays by the Bible, sing the invitation. The altar is open for you to respond to the Lord this evening. Oh, soul, are That's you right. weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the Savior And life more abundant and free Turn your eyes upon Jesus Look full in His wonderful face And the things of earth will grow strangely him in the light of his glory and grace through death into life everlasting he passed and we follow him there over us sin no more hath dominion for more than conquerors we are turn your eyes upon Jesus look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace his word shall not fail you, he promised. Believe him and all will be well. Then go to a world that is dying, his perfect salvation to tell. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Go ahead and be seated for a minute, if you would, please. Okay. All right. We are pleased to have Dave and Terry Yoder coming this evening, and they're coming for membership in our church. And uh, uh, most of you know that uh, they were here years ago, and uh, they served for 20 years in another Baptist church nearby here. And uh, the Lord now has led them uh, away from there, and they're back here with us. And He's also, um, God has led him to begin working with Brother Moreland and 1040 International. And uh, he's going to begin working with him in the training of the national pastors, uh, doing some traveling and such, and trying to teach and train those men in other countries, uh, not, not only with Brother Moreland, but other uh, missionaries as well as he might be needed. Uh, that's the burden I think God's placed on his heart. They'll base right here out of our church. They'll be sent by our church, and uh, we're honored that they would want us to do that. And uh, we're, we're really pleased that uh, God has brought them. You, some of you know, some of you don't know. Uh, Brother Yoder and I go back pretty far. 
and uh, he was, uh, I knew him when he was just a, a young boy, uh, probably 11, 12, 13 years of age, and uh, I was a counselor at camp, and he was a camper, and uh, so we go back quite a ways, grew up in the same church, Canton Baptist Temple, uh, up in Canton, Ohio, and so I know his brother, know his dad and mom, and uh, his dad and my father were good friends, talked together for years in the same Sunday school department, uh, Canton Baptist Temple, and so this is... Uh, this is just a, a great joy to my heart to be able to be with him again. And uh, looking forward to what God's going to do with them and, and through them. Pray for them. Uh, they're gonna, uh, he's going to have to get some support and go on deputation and that kind of thing and try to get churches to uh, get behind him. And uh, we'll, we'll get behind them. And uh, we'll, we'll help them and support them. I'm excited about the opportunity. Brother, some of you don't know, it's really Dr. Yoder. He has an earned doctorate. And you should know that. Uh, so that's uh, he's uh, he's got a real uh, real gift to be able to teach the word of God. Uh, his wife is extremely talented and uh, enthusiastic, and uh, it's uh, my wife has already gotten to enjoy her some and the projects that they've gotten involved with, and we've they've already jumped in and served in many different areas, and uh, it's just been a blessing to have you here. We're looking forward to serving with you prayerfully till the Lord comes back. Amen. And uh, that's great. All those in favor of welcoming them into the fellowship of our church, let it be known by hearty eye Aye. and opposed by like sign. That's great. All right. We'll have them. Uh, well, you just stay up front. Why don't you come around the front and greet them tonight? Will you do that? Uh, it's just us and tonight, so we could do that. And we'll leave them right here, okay? All right. Let's stand together. We'll have prayer. And you come by and welcome the Yoders into our fellowship, all right? Heavenly Father, we thank you for a wonderful day today. Thank you, God, for your goodness your blessing upon your people in this place. And Father, we're thankful that this church is the heart of God when it comes to missions. As we looked at that first missionary journey in our Sunday school class today, thank you for a church that is willing to send folks out with the gospel of Christ. And Lord, we're thankful for our position that we have in Christ. Thank you that we're saints of God. Lord, thank you that we've been blessed with all spiritual blessings. Thank you for your grace, your undeserved favor upon our lives. Lord, thank you for the word of God, that we have it to preach it. That we have it to transform our lives. Help us to despise not prophesyings. Thank you for the odors. May your hand rest upon them. Meet their needs, God, as they take this step of faith. You're always pleased when we walk by faith and not by sight. And Lord, help us as a church be behind them and support them and help them, encourage them, and be what they need, Lord, to do the work you've called them to do. Now, Father, we love you. We thank you for a wonderful day in the house of God. Dismiss us with your care, with your blessing. Make us mindful of your presence with us. May others see Christ in us this week. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, it's a grand thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. Let's sing it, all right? Uh, it's a grand thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. It's a grand thing to follow Jesus anywhere and everywhere I go. For it's a grand thing to be a soldier in his army here below. It's the grandest thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. God bless you. You are dismissed.